Um, welcome to our seventh FAFSA day presentation. We started these, this is our first one in October. Uh, we've been going monthly since, I think my math, and I do financial aid, so my math should be better than this, but I think we've probably reached almost six, almost 700 families um, in these past uh, five, four, five, six months, um, helping folks out. And then um, through our website and our email account, which I'll share with you, um, another good number of folks trying to get people through this process of filling out the financial aid uh, forms and help students to college. FAFSA Day is presented in the co uh, cooperation with an organization named uh, MASFA, the Massachusetts Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, and MIFA, the Massachusetts Education Financing um, Authority, along with the American Student Assistance. We have, we're planning about 300 folks uh, joining us tonight. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and share them. And then my friends and colleagues who are with me tonight will answer that. Along with myself, I should introduce myself. My name is Mike Goodwin. I'm Assistant Director of Financial Aid at Williams College out in the Berkshires. I'm joined by Jennifer Bento Pinion, who is the Director of Math of MIFA Pathways, and Elizabeth Savrinos, who's the Assistant Director of Financial Aid at Simmons College. Tonight's presentation will be led by Amy Staff here, who's the Director of Student Financial Aid at Simmons College. As we go through the presentation, please put your questions in the Q&A section. Afterwards, if you have further questions, you can send them to uh, fastfaday at gmail.com. We'll get back to you as soon as we can with that. If you go to our website, fastfaday.org, you'll find a number to MIFA, and MIFA has a hotline to help you fill out your forms and answer any questions you might have. With that, Amy, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, before I jump into the presentation, I just want to, um, to let you know that uh, as we go on, um, you know, we may get stopped and have some questions um, answered. Some of the questions that, that we've gotten at the presentations previously are around, you know, who should be filling out the FAFSA um, as far as the parent is concerned. So we will uh, answer that question um, as we go through the presentation. Uh, and then we've heard from families who, uh, you know, have been affected by COVID-19 and their kind of financial picture looks different now than what's being asked on the FAFSA. So we'll talk about that uh, when, we, when we get to the point where we're entering um, financial information. Uh, feel free if you, you know, have another screen um, that you want to bring up or another device um, that you want to bring up the FAFSA and follow along. We're really going to kind of go um, right through it. Um, and so we're, we'll just go ahead and get started now. So we've already talked about who our partners are. So um, the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. Um, we always highlight that word free um, because there is no cost. Uh, there used to be actually um, a, a FAFSA.com that used to charge people uh, to complete this application, but it is free. Uh, there's lots of help from people like ourselves. You can always reach out to a financial aid office as well uh, if you have any questions. Uh, the website is uh, here, fafsa.ed.gov. Uh, and it does need to com be completed each and every year uh, if a student is applying uh, for financial aid. So who is eligible for federal aid? The basic criteria is um, you have to be a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen. And so we've included those eligible non-citizen statuses here. And that would be the, the student, the one who's going to be in college. There are certainly situations where we've had um, the parents are not citizens, but the student is, and the student is still eligible uh, for federal aid. So when you go to that, um, uh, the website that we just saw, the fafsa.ed.gov, um, there'll be a login here. So depending on who you are, if you're the student, you're gonna be checking off student. If you are the parent, you're gonna be checking that off. Uh, the student can log in with an FSA ID uh, and I will talk about that on the next screen. But if you're the parent and you um, check, you're basically gonna put some information about your student name, 
social security number, uh, date of birth and such. The FSA ID is your signature, really, your electronic signature for this form. It's also how you can get back in to do corrections and such, but really it is your signature when you're going to complete this form, as well as if you're ever going to borrow loans through the federal government, you would be using that FSA ID as well. The student needs to have their own FSA ID and one parent, at least one parent in a, in a two parent household, at least one parent, because it's just one person signing off for the parent uh, needs to have an FSA ID. If you, the parent, already have an FSA ID because you are in school or you have another child um, that you have completed a FAFSA for and signed off and you have an FSA ID, you as the parent only need one FSA ID. Uh, each student needs to complete their own FAFSA. So if you have two um, students in school, we get that question a lot. If you do not yet have an FSA ID, you can go to fsaid.ed.gov uh, and that's where you can sign up for one. And then the note at the bottom that um, parents who do not have a social security number, um, you, you would not be able to um, receive an FSA ID because it asks for your social security number. And so to be able to sign uh, the FAFSA form, there is the ability to print a paper signature page, uh, which you can sign and then uh, mail in and kind of sync up with the electronic application. Once you get through that first uh, login, make sure you are clicking on the right year. So for um, typically we have uh, students who are in their senior year in high school at these presentations. Uh, and if that's the case, um, you want to make sure you're clicking on that start your 2122-2021-2022 FAFSA because that's the year next year that the student will be enrolled. You can choose to create a save key. Uh, this would allow you to go back into the application prior to actually submitting it. So if you want to, if you're want, gonna go in and um, add some data, but you're not yet ready to um, submit the application, um, you can use this save key to go right back in um, and everything would be saved, uh, the data that you've put in. When you get into the FAFSA and you begin to um, complete it, it's going to be first asking about student demographic information. The FAFSA is really the student's application and the parent information um, when, when a parent is filling out their information is kind of supplemental. So you'll, the, the wording will say you and you know, and your social security number and your address. And when it's saying you and your, it's you, the student, right? So it will say your parent when it's referencing parent information. So just again, something to be aware of. Um, people in the field know that sometimes we'll see where um, parent information comes in as the student demographic information or as the, the student tax information um, because there was just some confusion in filling it out. So just pointing that little tip out. Uh, a few other tips, you know, it's gonna ask for an email address. Um, make sure it's one that the student is checking. Um, you'll get data back um, from that. You will also be reminded to complete a, a FAFSA in another year. Uh, you also want to avoid using, um, you know, a school specific email address that the student would end up losing access to that um, in later years. It's going to ask for uh, gender, you know, are you male or female? Um, and that's really to determine um, selective service. Uh, that's another thing that uh, a student has to, if they are male and over 18, they must be registered with selective service uh, in order to be eligible for uh, federal student aid. We'll go through a series of student eligibility questions. Um, if, you know, and I suppose this could reach out and, and someone could be here from another state. Um, but this particular one we're talking about Massachusetts, the student would have already answered and told us, told the FAFSA in their form that they are, they live in Massachusetts. It will ask, have you lived there at least five years? Answering information about your state 
sends the FAFSA form actually to your state agency. So here um, in Massachusetts, it's OSFA, uh, and they will use that information to determine, does the student qualify for any Massachusetts state grant? Uh, and so it does ask for uh, residency um, as there is a requirement there. It's also going to ask about citizenship. Um, make sure you answer that correctly. So if you are a US citizen, you're saying US citizen. If you are a permanent resident, make sure you're answering it as permanent resident uh, because uh, on our next screen, uh, that status will be verified um, for citizens with the Social Security Administration uh, and for eligible non-citizens, permanent residents, uh, it will check with the Department of Homeland Security. So sometimes we've seen where that wasn't answered quite properly and, and we've just had to follow up with students uh, and they have to provide proof of uh, citizenship status. Some more questions uh, for the student. Um, and it's these ones are asking about the high school completion status um, and when, um, uh, what degree the student is seeking. Um, sometimes I do see students who are confused on this uh, question. Um, so high school completion status, if your, uh, you know, son or daughter is in, or you yourself, if you're the high school student here, um, are in um, high school, you're in your senior year of high school, you're going to say that um, you will have a high school diploma, um, you know, when you're in school, because it will be asking for when you are in college. Um, so you would check that off. Uh, and then it will ask you um, the name of that high school uh, and where it's located. Uh, typically for a current high school student, you're gonna be selecting never before attended college and also that you do not have a bachelor's degree. Um, Additionally, you'd want to check off that you're going for your first bachelor's degree. Uh, again, um, you know, notes from the field, I guess. Uh, sometimes we see where um, students have put, you know, they're, a, they're coming out of high school and they've put, you know, a graduate degree or a second bachelor's degree, uh, which, uh, you know, we follow up, it's, it's not the correct. So, um, so first bachelor's uh, and never before attended college. And then this uh, last bullet point here, interested in federal work study. So that was a question here um, and I'm pointing to the screen as if you can see, um, but uh, where I'm pointing. So are you interested in being considered for work study? Uh, what, and, and a lot of times students have no idea really what that means, right? When they're filling out this form. Um, and so if you answer yes, it does not obligate you um, to, to take on that work study position. Really, um, some institutions um, will use that answer to decide and to award uh, an allocation of potential work study funding to a student. And if they answer no, then they won't. Work study funding is money that comes from the government and is, is given as a pot of funding to an institution. Every institution has a different allocation Typically some uh, institutions that have been around a lot longer may have more funding and some institutions really have very small level of funding. So, so you may even see that you've answered yes and you might uh, receive you know, an, an, an amount in an award letter at one institution and not at another. It really just opens up some opportunities as a student um, to potentially be working on campus. Typically a student still has to go out and apply for a work study job, um, but it can open up an opportunity. And a student is never, um, again, bound if they're given work study eligibility that they have to use that funding and have to get a job that is a work study job. Uh, so in my eyes, what I always tell, um, you know, students and families uh, in doing, you know, presentations is, you know, why limit yourself? Put yes and, and see, um, and it, it's kind of no harm there. So selective service, again, I, I, I mentioned that it will ask, you know, are you male or female? Uh, so again, students who are male and over 18 are required to register with selective service. Um, you know, if a student isn't yet 18, that's fine. They'll get caught in the next year. Or, although I should say breaking news um, in the, just before um, the winter holiday, uh, there was a, um, an appropriation act put into place and they are removing this requirement um, beginning with the 23-24 year. Uh, so, so that will be gone. It's next going to ask for 
the schools in which you want to send um, your FAFSA data. So once you've actually pressed submit, when you're all done with the application, uh, this information electronically gets sent to the institutions that you list here. So as you can see, you can list up to 10 colleges and universities. Now, if you need to add more than 10 schools, what you can do is once those schools have gotten that information, so you really wanna wait until um, you've gotten a student aid report, it's kind of data back from the government that things have been processed. Um, and that way, you know, it's typically about 48 hours um, that, that the school has gotten that information. Then you can come in back into the FAFSA using that FSA ID, you come to the school selection page <clears throat> and you can remove a school and then you can add another school on and then go, go to the end and, and hit submit. And then that transaction happens and that new school gets the information. When all is said and done and the student knows where, um, you know, they are going to attend uh, for next fall, you just want to make sure that that school is still listed um, on, on the application. Uh, there's a school code, um, you know, back many years ago, you'd, you'd always really have to know what the school code was of each institution. Uh, but nowadays you can search by state, um, you know, city and by institution name to pull out that school. I also want to um, highlight the fact that you can complete the FAFSA uh, with just one school, right? Uh, and so let's say that you knew one school that you wanted to attend, you can put that on there, you can submit it, and you can go back and you can always add schools um, if you decide that you, know, you want to apply to some other schools. So just know that as well. For each school that you will add, you have to select a housing option, right? So it's either gonna be on campus, off campus, or with parent. I will just point out that some institutions um, require first year students to live on campus, or they may require it and they have um, some sort of protocol where a student can um, apply to you know, live at home because they live close by. Um, so you might see that the institution actually changes that, that selection um, because they require that. Um, that's just kind of an FYI. Um, but still, for each institution, just put um, on there um, which uh, you really are looking to do. Um, and institutions will use that information in building that cost of attendance. So whether or not they need to put the, the charge in there for on-campus uh, room and board. So once we've gotten through that, now we are get to a set of questions that determines a student's dependency. And dependency really means if they are a dependent student, which most students coming out of high school are, that means that they provide parent information. And if it's deemed that the student is an independent student, um, then they do not need to report um, any parent information. So, so what are those questions that determine dependency? You as the student would be answering these um, questions, basically, you know, what's your date of birth? So if a student is 24 or older, that's the most common where they are an independent student. Or if the student is married, a graduate student, um, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these, I think you can read them. Um, but any one of these bullet points, if answered yes to the question, um, would determine that the student is um, an independent student. And again, the majority of students in high school um, are, are not uh, independent students, but there certainly are cases um, where they automatically, um, for instance, in a legal guardianship, uh, an orphan or foster care ward of the court, um, I point those out because I also um, like to point out that you may be asked for documentation, uh, court documentation of those um, because it makes a student independent and because um, financial aid offices often see um, things get checked off because people don't understand what the wording says. Uh, and, so, um, and so you just may be asked for some sort of documentation. So just, just know that ahead of time. Now, it also could be true 
um, that a student doesn't fit into the kind of standard independent um, uh, situation automatically, but perhaps they have special circumstances um, and they're not able to provide parental information. So if it is deemed that the student is a dependent student, but they're not able to provide parent information, um, they can check off, I am unable to provide parent information. Uh, this will go to an institution, but the student themselves will need to reach out to the institution. Uh, they will need to provide documentation. Um, we as financial aid um, uh, professionals have certain rules we have to follow with the federal government. And so to do something which call, is called a dependency override, so overriding that dependency status, um, we have to follow pretty strict guidelines. Um, so it can't just be that a parent doesn't want to provide information um, <clears throat> or that you file your own tax return. Uh, it has to be a, a special circumstance, unusual. Um, typically we've seen situations of, you know, kind of abusive situations uh, and such. Um, and, and we have to collect third party documentation. Um, but, but those options are there and exist uh, to help students who might be in uh, a situation where they don't qualify as uh, automatically as an independent student. I've just explained this slide. <laughs> So if a student is unable to provide that parental info uh, and be able to move forward, uh, the expected family contribution will not be calculated. So um, you can kind of move through the FAFSA, but all of the data points are not going to be fully um, you know, processed because you really do need to reach out to the school and have some intervention on the application. Uh, right here on the second bullet point, this, you'll be prompted as a student to follow up uh, with the financial aid office. Um, and as I've said, the student may need to provide some additional documentation. So now we're going to assume that a student has completed, they are a dependent student, um, and so now they need to um, complete parent information. It will begin by asking for, and, and the FAFSA has really changed wording, they've moved away from saying, enter mother's information or enter father's information. It's parent one and then parent two, if there is a parent two. And, and I'll get into that in just one second, but it's gonna ask for social security number, last name, and just first initial. So who exactly is considered a parent? And then who exactly should be putting their information on the FAFSA? That is what I'm going to answer now. And I know uh, that can oftentimes uh, produce a lot of questions. So hopefully um, we'll be able to answer that here. So biological or adoptive parents, right? They're considered a parent. You are going to include both parents if the parents are married or if they're not married, but they live together. Include information for both of those parents. There was a time where people who were biological parents, but unmarried <clears throat> um, and living together that you'd kind of select one parent, but they made changes to that a number of years ago. Married parents include same sex couples. Um, if they were married in a state that recognizes same sex marriage, both of those parents would be included on the FAFSA. And then in the case of divorced or separated parents, you provide information for the parent that the student lived with more in the past 12 months. If that parent is remarried, you have to include the step parent on the FAFSA form as well. And I know that can, can sometimes be a, a hard point with uh, families, but that is exactly what the federal government has deemed uh, for this form. There's always communicating with an institution for, um, you know, special consideration or what have you. But as far as the FAFSA form is concerned, those are who should be listed on the FAFSA. I have had situations where um, uh, parents have said that they're divorced or they're separated and they, but they're still living together. And in that case, both parents' information should be on there. 
So now who is not considered a parent? Um, you know, foster parent or legal guardians, that was one of the questions uh, that determined independent status, you know, if you um, are in a legal guardianship or uh, in foster care. Uh, sometimes there's been situations where a student lives with a grandparent, but they weren't deemed the legal guardian. Uh, they are not considered a parent, um, so you wouldn't be putting their information on the FAFSA form or any other relative. I'm just going to ask my um, my volunteers uh, manning the chat. Are there any um, questions still lingering um, that you're seeing that are coming up about um, who is the parent or who should be completing the FAFSA? We actually do not have any lingering. Great. Yes, you did a okay. wonderful job explaining that. Perfect. <laughs> um, all right. So moving on, the next thing that we'll be asked about is the household size of the parent's household, right? You're gonna always include the student in that. You will include the parent or parents, depending um, on how, how many parents are in the household. The parents, other dependent children, if the parents are providing more than half of their support or they are fully dependent, as we determined, and then any other people who live with the parents. So sometimes we might have a grandparent who's in the household. So if the parent is providing more than half of their support and will continue to do so in the upcoming academic year, then you can include those people in the household size as well. I know I realize this is kind of small, but it's just kind of, I actually sat with a family and was um, with actually a student who was filling this out and it got confusing because this, this actually will add up the figures for you as you're entering data. So just be mindful of that because the student that I was working with um, had kind of was double counting uh, people. Uh, so just be mindful on this, these grayed out boxes um, kind of get, get added up for you. So you're adding just in additional people. The next question that's going to be asked that is related to household size is of the people who are in that household, who are the students that are going to be in college at least half time in the upcoming year? So you're always going to include the student. So it should at least be one person in college. And then any other household members except parents. <laughs> so other you know, children, if they will attend at least half time in the 21-22 um, year in a program that leads to a college degree or certificate. So if they're just enrolled in a class um, you know, at, at, at a school that, and they're not in a full program um, and that would actually be less than half time, you would not include them. Um, you never include the parents uh, in the number in college. And again, that's just a, that's just a federal rule. And then just know um, that some institutions, not all, um, may look for um, proof that a, an, another child is actually in uh, college. So that may be something that happens at the beginning of the academic year. Um, it's a, like a sibling verification form um, that your child um, will need to um, you know, probably send to their sibling that goes to their registrar's office at their institution to verify that yes, that student is enrolled um, uh, at least half time. The number in college really affects the expected family contribution. And, you know, if there are two in college, it cuts that in half. That's a data output of the FAFSA form. Um, so that's why institutions, um, you know, will um, sometimes be looking for that proof. Amy, I'm yeah. sorry, I am going to interrupt because we, we have had a couple of questions come in on um, in regards to the, the parent and um, in the case of divorced parents. Yep. So what if um, the parents have 50-50, 50-50 custody, what happens in that case? So the federal government has um, said, you know, whoever the um, child lives with more, and if that is 50-50, whoever provides more support uh, for the child. And actually one of the changes that's being made is 
for that 23, 24, so a while off is, is they're changing that and it's in the custodial parent is who provides more support. Um, so who they live with more, if that is 50-50, it goes to who provides more support for the child. Now, if that is 50-50, you're, you're just gonna have to make a determination on your own because it, it doesn't really go uh, much past that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then one other question in regards to that: What if um, a, what if a student is not able to get parent information? So, if a student is not able to get parent information, um, as I said, you can kind of submit the FAFSA without that parent information, but it's not going to be fully complete, um, and you would need to go through a process of. <clears throat> contacting each institution and walking through why you're not able to provide that information. Um, if it's just that the parent doesn't want to provide it, um, there's you're probably not going to really be eligible for much as far as financial aid is concerned. You'll have to talk. Each institution is very different, but it's probably federal aid. Like you might be eligible for a small um, unsubsidized loan, but that may be it. If it's a situation where you have some sort of special circumstance um, that is kind of out of your control, that is documented, that you know there's some sort of abusive situation or some reason that's um, very um, kind of special circumstance reason that you cannot get that information, then the school will work with you um, to figure out um, the process of doing this dependency override so it's okay um, that you do not have parent information and, and things get pushed through um, to be able to produce that expected family contribution. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. That covers, thank you. Perfect. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the financial information that goes into the FAFSA. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is just go through each of these questions um, for the parent and then we're not going to repeat this for student financial information because it's the exact same. Um, so we'll just go through what the, the parent is, is inputting. So you can utilize what's called an IRS data retrieval tool. So there's certain data elements from a family's tax return if they have filed a tax return. AGI, taxes paid, certain untaxed income that comes right off the fact of the uh, tax return. And we've now, we're now in several years, probably, I mean, it could be eight years now that we've had this tool where um, you can kind of jump over to the IRS and pull that data in. So it, it pulls in the AGI, the taxes paid, uh, and those certain untaxed data elements, which is great. Um, for students who are applying for 21-22, they, you're required to use 2019 federal tax data. Most people um, have already submitted that, uh, you know, uh, that information. I was going to say last April, but I believe there was an extension until July uh, to submit. So, um, but still most families have already submitted that uh, and have that on hand, which is great. Um, there are certain people who can't use the data retrieval tool. So if you're married filing separately, it just it can't pull that information in. Um, so you should just grab a copy of your um, you know, 2019 taxes and use that. Now, we know, as I said in the beginning, that for, uh, for some families, 2020 or even 2021 does not look financially how 2019 looks. Maybe you've had job loss uh, due to COVID or some you know, medical uh, or any number of special circumstances. You still are required to use the 2019 tax information to complete the FAFSA form. But similar to the professional judgment to do a dependency override, um, financial aid professionals can do a professional judgment so and make an adjustment to data that is on the FAFSA. 
So you should be in touch with the institution themselves and find out what that process is for them. It's not standard across every institution. It's quite similar, but someone might have you um, send in you know, a special circumstances letter. Another institution might have you fill out an appeal form where you're listing out what the special circumstance is and you're uploading documentation of that. Um, it might be that you can use 2020 tax information um, and, and you might have to provide that tax form for 2020. Um, but if you have any sort of special circumstances, even if you, your income isn't different, but it's some significant um, medical expenses um, that you uh, had within 2020 or 2019, that is something that you need to speak with the financial aid office um, uh, themselves and find out what their process is. Um, and, and they may be able to make an adjustment um, to the FAFSA form for you. So the parent tax information, um, it's going to ask a, a set of questions, you know, have your parents completed? So again, even if you're the parent filling it out, it's going to say, have your parents completed um, the IRS income tax return, right? So your answers are either, either already completed, will complete, and or will not file and not required to file. Um, there always may be situations where an institution um, may look for some verification. So if you say will not file and not required, we may have to follow up um, depending on if you've been selected for a verification, which we'll talk about uh, just after uh, we get through the, the financial part here. Um, so we may have to collect documentation of that. It's gonna ask what sort of tax return you completed. So an IRS 1040 or a foreign tax return. Uh, and then it's going to ask for your tax filing status. So were you as a parent, did you file single? Did you file married filing jointly? Um, did you file married filing separate? In the case of a family who, let's say they were married in 2019 and they filed marily, married filing joint in 2019, and now that parent is um, divorced or separated. And so their income looks different. You can um, not use the data retrieval tool and you could enter the information just for yourself. You'd still want to, you know, fill out that in 2019, you did file married filing jointly, but you can break out the information to, to um, basically be just that parent's information who is on the FAFSA form. Again, you may be asked by the financial aid office for a copy of you know, your tax return. You may be asked for documentation that you are living separately. Um, so just know that and try and collect that ahead of time because it's likely that they uh, may ask for that, but, but it is perfectly okay to be using just your information if you are divorced or separated, but in 2019 you had um, you know, filed uh, jointly. So if you are going to use the data retrieval tool, um, you <clears throat> will come to this um, screen and it's letting you know that you're, you're leaving the FAFSA, you're going on, off to this IRS site. So you would click to uh, proceed to IRS site. The data is um, extremely secure. Um, probably four years ago, um, it went through a period of time where the data retrieval tools are down because they did significant work to it to ensure safety uh, and security. And when you actually look at the data, um, most of it is X'd out. Um, and even when it comes back into the FAFSA, um, and that's really just a security measure. When you've come back, when you've brought that um, IRS data into the FAFSA form, um, it will tell you that you successfully uh, transferred that information. It, you could be in a situation where it says you did not successfully transfer or there was an issue with the data retrieval tool. Um, it, it has been fairly um, successful this year. I haven't heard much of people not being able to use the data retrieval tool, so, um, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, 
But again, here, my um, bullet down here that the tax information uh, will not be visible due to security. Um, and amended tax filers um, can use the data retrieval tool, um, but it will be from their original tax return. So you may want to, um, again, be in touch with um, you know, the, the financial aid office um, if you have an amended uh, return or could make updates. Now, if you are entering information yourself, this is the information that is being pulled in from the data retrieval tool. And I will also point out, when you are completing the FAFSA, for every question, right on the right, there is a little circle with a question mark. Um, and you can click on that. It will open up a little box and it will tell you, for instance, with AGI, it will tell you the exact line on the 1040 where to find AGI. Uh, so that's really helpful as you as you fill this out. So if you don't use the data retrieval tool and you're um, having to put in hand enter key in that AGI, it can tell you exactly where that lives. <clears throat> Excuse me. Income earned from working. This is something that you will have to enter in no matter if you use the data retrieval tool or not. It's not double counting anything from the AGI. In fact, that data of um, income earned from working is used um, as an allowance against income. It, it's used to calculate a figure for um, certain taxes. Uh, and, and so that's where that comes from. So sometimes people think, well, I've already put the AGI where the income kind of flowed through, um, but that's not what, why it's asking that information. So you're gonna use a W-2 form that you would receive um, typically, but if you have a business, um, you might have some information that flows through from a Schedule C. Um, and again, right on, <coughs> excuse me, right on the FAFSA form, if you, um, the, the circle with the little uh, question mark, you can click on that and it will tell you the various line uh, items, including if you have a business where you would find that information. Here it says, you know, parent one and parent two. I always think like, remember who you designated as parent one and parent two uh, when you're filling this out. Not that it matters all that much, but um, uh, but you know, it's it's kind of good to kind of keep that consistent. It will ask a question: Is is one of the parents a dislocated worker? Um, which sometimes people are confused, like what exactly is that? So, a dislocated worker is someone who is receiving unemployment benefits um, because they've lost a job and they're not likely to return. Um, or someone who is laid off or received a layoff notice. Uh, or someone who is self-employed uh, and is now unemployed uh, due to economic conditions or natural disaster. So I'm sure there's uh, many people who uh, might fit into that category. Um, or a displaced homemaker. Now that would be for instance, um, uh, a, a parent who was at home and was not working outside the home and, and they were kind of taking care of the home and, and, and such. Um, and now uh, let's say they're, they're divorced and they're not currently working. That would be a displaced homemaker. It will ask about if anyone in the household received these benefits in either 2019 or 2020. So you'll just check off yes if anyone in the household received any sort of um, these sorts of benefits. So it asks about parents income tax. So again, if you use the data retrieval tool, that is going to flow in right from the tax return. But if not, there's a certain line um, item on the, the 1040. Uh, it's actually when you look at it, you'll think, well, is that really the tax? Because it doesn't say tax on it. Um, it's kind of a, a, a more of a calculated feel. But here, this bullet point, the, you know, don't be confused with the amount that was withheld um, because sometimes you're paying more in tax. Sometimes you're actually getting a refund. Um, so that is not the amount that is uh, the income tax that was paid. But it is on the tax return, again, right in that, um, that circle with the question mark, you click on it and it's gonna tell you the exact line uh, where to find that on the tax return. So once we've 
taking care of the information that comes in through the tax return, um, there's some other financial information that it will ask about. And you're basically just going to indicate whether in 2019 you had any of this data. So the American Opportunity Tax Credit or Lifetime Tax Credit. Again, that is right on the tax return itself. Whether or not you um, paid out any child support. The third bullet point here, taxable earnings from work study. These same questions are asked on the student side as well as the parent side. Um, that might be something that a student answers yes on if they utilized work study while they were in college and they might put their earnings there. Um, typically, I've never seen a parent uh, answer, answer anything there. Same with the next bullet about grant and scholarship aid reported to the IRS. So if a student receives grant and scholarship aid that exceeds um, like the tuition and fee figure, uh, that amount is taxable. Uh, and um, so a student might in a year have to report that. Um, it's not the most common. Um, and then combat pay and then um, co-op education programs uh, earnings. So again, on the parent side, typically what I would see is perhaps, you know, the tax credit um, education tax credit, the first one, or child support paid. So additionally, um, so untaxed income, you're going to check all that apply to you and report those specific amounts if you're saying, yes, we had this sort of untaxed income. Uh, and some colleges and universities, again, may ask um, uh, about untaxed income, uh, may follow up. Um, I, I will also point out that some institutions may use a supplemental form as well. Um, so I always like to point out so much focuses on the FAFSA form, um, but some institutions require the FAFSA as well as uh, the CSS profile form. So make sure um, you know for the institutions that you or your son or daughter are applying, what forms uh, are required. So now that we've talked about income and we've filled that information out, we move into parent assets. It will have a point after you've completed the income information where it will say, based on the income, are your parents' assets above, and it will give a figure. And if you say yes, then you report those uh, assets. If you say no, you're given the option to not answer uh, the asset questions. Um, so just know that you'll have that question kind of in between the income and assets. So parents would be asked to report um, current balance, right? cash savings, checking account. Next, they'll ask if uh, the value of any investments. Um, so real estate, not primary home, real estate, but if you have a rental property or a, a second home, um, also if you actually live, say, in a, let's say you live in a three family, um, you wouldn't report, you know, one third of it if you're living in that and, and you're renting out two thirds, but you would be kind of um, reporting two thirds of the value. And, you know, and the value would be what the value is less any debt you have on that. Um, so other investments, money market, mutual funds, um, college savings account. We often get questions about that. So the questions are typically, um, I have a college account. Who do I report it as an asset under? Is it a parent asset? Is it student asset? So for a 529 um, college account, um, the parent is the owner of the account and the student is the beneficiary. Therefore, um, it gets reported as a parent asset, um, which actually is a good thing because parent assets are assessed at a lower rate, about 5% of parent asset like would go into the expected family contribution, where on the student side, it's about 20% of student assets. Um, the other question we get about college savings uh, is if I have um, you know, more than one child, do I just report the college savings account for that for the one child that I'm filling out the FAFSA for? No, you would be filling it out for, for all the college savings accounts that you have. Net value of business and investment farm. Um, 
so if if you have a, a business or farm that is something that you're reporting here but if it is a small family business and the the government defines that as um, less than 100 employees and more than half owned by that family then you do not have to report that asset so you'll see in my circle here you do not include your primary home residence value you do not um, report life insurance as an asset you do not report your the value of your retirement accounts um, and you do not report the value of a um, small family business. So now we go on to you've you're done with parent information. You've filled out your demographic information. You filled out the income information, the asset information. Now you move on to the student financial information you're gonna go through the exact same questions that we just went through on the parent. It's gonna ask about tax filing status. Um, most students or many students coming out of high school um, do not file a tax return. So they would answer, you know, did not file, not required to file, but putting in the earnings amount in there. Um, it's gonna ask really the exact same set of questions. Uh, oftentimes you kind of, fly through a little bit quicker because you already know what the questions are uh, and there's usually less answers on the student side. And once you've gotten through the student income and asset questions, um, you're now at the point um, to sign and submit. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll note here, um, it is kind of nice each time you go through a different section, you kind of get a nice little green checkbox that you've kind of made it through uh, those sections and then you get down to the sign and submit. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you will hear um, the darker blue box that says provide student signature and provide parent signature. So if the student is logged in with their FSA ID and they click on provide student signature, it's, it's going to basically go to a screen that says, great, you've provided the signature, you know, go move on and you click and it will come back to the screen and then you click on provide parent signature the parent will need to use their FSA ID in order to sign. So when you press on provide parent signature, a box will pop up and it will ask for the FSA ID and password. Uh, and then you click uh, submit um, and, and then you move on um, to the confirmation page. Again, for a family, um, you know, who if a parent doesn't have an FSA ID because they don't have a social security number, you can print um, a, um, a signature page and mail that in. Obviously, that's, you know, takes a little bit longer uh, for, for things to move on. But in the electronic uh, submission, you know, a school should have that information within, you know, 48 hours. So you get to this confirmation page. And, you know, it lets you know your FAFSA was successfully submitted. Uh, it gives you this DRN number. This one doesn't have one. Um, and it tells you, <clears throat> excuse me, basically what is going to happen. So it's letting you know that you, it says you will receive. So you, the student, will receive. Um, excuse me, I'm getting a, a dry throat. They're going to get an email confirmation. Um, a parent would get one as well if they put their email on uh, the FAFSA. And then it will let you know in a few days that, that the FAFSA has been fully processed. Now, let me give you an example of um, a FAFSA not being fully processed. Let's say you didn't, um, you didn't provide both signatures, right? Um, that's, gonna, that's gonna take some time because it can't kind of go through the process. Um, the student gets what's called a student aid report by email. This is gonna list out everything that was provided on the FAFSA form. Make sure that's looked through. It's also going to provide information. Uh, it was gonna provide the EFC, uh, which is the expected family contribution, which colleges use um, to help calculate a student's financial aid eligibility. It is going to tell the student if there's anything that they might need to do and follow up on if they were selected for verification. And I think, yeah. Uh, on the next page. Um, 
So they will be informed on that, that form if they were selected for verification. Now, this is a process that actually the institution will follow up with the student and let them know what they need to do. <clears throat> Typically, if someone has used the data retrieval tool, they might be less likely to be selected, but um, we still see that um, sometimes families are selected. Verification is just the government randomly selecting applications and then institutions having to verify that certain data elements are correct. Um, that is AGI, taxes paid, those certain non-taxed income, so from the um, a tax return, and then household size and number in college. Um, so you might have to complete something called a verification worksheet. Um, the institution will tell you that. Some institutions will require that you have that completed and into them before they will award you aid. Some institutions will award you aid as estimated until they can receive that data and kind of verify, and then they will finalize it. And then other institutions um, will kind of, you know, award you and they might follow up with you later um, in the school year to do that verification. But each institution will be communicating with you. So, um, you know, I, I, I would always encourage that students are, you know, making sure they're really checking uh, their email um, because institutions are going to be communicating with the student. That's the email they have. That's who they'll be communicating with. So, um, so encourage it for parents, you know, encourage your children to, to be looking at their email. Um, and if there are students on here, make sure you are looking at that email that you used to complete the FAFSA. Um, and then, and then colleges will, um, you know, then send, um, information about financial aid eligibility. Um, sometimes it might come with the admission letter. Sometimes it might come after. Um, so again, every institution is different. If you ever have any questions or concerns, um, make sure you reach out to, to the financial aid office at, at the institution, um, each and every one, if you have questions, um, and they'll be able to help you um, answer any questions, kind of help you navigate through the process um, successfully. So that is the end of the presentation. Uh, are there any kind of lingering questions that uh, the team wants to put forward or uh, yes. any, any others? Yes, Amy, there were a couple, just a okay. couple. Um, and I feel like these are kind of common questions that we get. Mm -hmm. um, if a parent has a joint account with a student, with their student, um, where would that be on, on the student side or the parent side? Mm -hmm. Where would that document? Yeah, I mean, I would probably just put it on the parent side. Okay, easy enough. All right. And then the other question is, um, is child support included if it's paid by a parent for stepchildren? So child support paid by a parent for, for their children. So we have a mom who's married yeah. and they're paying child support for the father's. Children. So let me, I just want to, Make sure I, I'm get so. the The FAFSA will ask about child support paid and, and or child support received. So there's two different. So if you're paying out child support, it kind of reduces from income, and if you're receiving child support, it is um, kind of getting added to income. But this specific question has me feeling as though um, I'm just not sure that I have it a hundred percent. So when you're saying for stepchildren, so if the parent who is filling out the FAFSA, if they are paying out yes. child support, they're paying out child support. Yeah. If, if they are paying out child support, they are listing it on there and it basically ends up reducing from income. So it's, it's not, yeah. but, but Sorry, yeah, I... if they are paying it out, okay. it would I think be I, uh, great. And then um, let's see, we have a bunch of questions that just came in. Um, let's see. Do we have to report a grandparent's home that is in the parent's name with a life estate for the grandparent? That's a great question. Um, so, 
So it's the home is in the parent's name, but it's the grandparent's home. I mean, technically it's, it's technically if it's in the parent's name, they probably should be, but um, I would be, I, if that was me, I would be then being in touch with the school to kind of explain that and um, ask that that's not included um, as an asset. And another question I feel like we get a lot is if we've already submitted the FAFSA and we want to change something, is that, yep. can we do that? Can we, how so, do we go? So you can, if something is incorrect, um, and I mean, not saying that someone would go in and make a change to something that already was correct, but, um, but yes, you can go back in and just, as I've kind of been saying all along, like, don't be surprised if an institution might reach out to you and just ask like, oh, you know, why was this changed? Um, you know, particularly if it's something like assets, because assets are as of the day that you complete the FAFSA, so that's, that's the verbiage that they use, you know, as of the day you're completing this, what is in your, you know, savings account or, or whatever. So, so if you're making a change like that, I wouldn't be surprised if the school just reaches out and says, hey, can you explain why this was changed? Okay, that's great. Thanks, Amy. And I'll, I will just say that if, if there have been a couple of inquiries about one-on-one -on -one, um, help after this webinar. So we do have our hotline, which will follow up um, after this presentation or tomorrow with a recording of the session along with the, the slide deck that Amy um, went through and then there will be our hotline or email. And I will also add, and I'll pop it in the chat that um, MIFA offers one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions. So uh, I'll put that in the chat for folks and that would be something that you would actually schedule with someone from the college planning team at MIFA. So I'll drop that in for you, for you folks if, if there are any lingering questions after we wrap up. Great. Amy, thank you for, for doing this. And you know, we've done a number of these and everyone, it feels like questions are different for each each group. So it's, I, I feel like I learned so much more as we do. Um, as Jennifer said, MIFA has a hotline you can reach. I would recommend going to our website, fastforday.org, and that number is listed right there. I'll tell you it's 800-449-6332, but Jennifer will follow up tomorrow um, or you can go to the website, fastforday.org. You can also email us your questions at fastforday at gmail.com, and we will answer them as best we can as we go forward. It looks like there's still some questions we're trying to answer. I think we'll continue to try to, and we'll end the presentation, and we'll try to answer those questions as best we can. But thank you for coming tonight, and good luck with your journey. Take care.